I am very happy to introduce Sarah Miller McCune, who is the founder uh, and publisher of, and president of Sage Publications, which has just celebrated its 50th anniversary. She doesn't look that old, but she was the founder 50 years ago. <laughs> And Sage, through Sarah, has done an enormous number of things for the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences. As I said earlier in the day, she personally has, with Sage, has endowed the directorship of the center, so I am the Sarah Miller McCune director. Sage has also been the major sponsor of the Behavioral and Social Sciences Summit since its founding. She's also an important supporter of the Social Science Research Council as well. <laughs> um, and one of the things that uh, she's done with CASBIS and SAGE has done with CASBIS is to create an, an, an annual CASBIS, well, sorry, say, I always do that, SAGE CASBIS Prize. And I am going to now turn it over to Sarah so that she can introduce the prize winner. This is a man who deserves your applause, Kenneth Pruitt. Ken was, um, has been for a long time a good friend of SAGE and of the social and behavioral sciences. He is himself one of the most distinguished political scientists that I know. I met you first at an American Political Science Association meeting. We won't go back how many decades ago that was, but it was a long time. And Sage was a very, very young company, and I was, uh, I had different colored hair, it was brown then. But we, I knew from that moment that this would be a great advisor as we sought to bring the knowledge and the wisdom of social science to inform public policy, and to make the world a better place. And that is what Ken's career in the social and behavioral sciences has been all about, including his stint under Bill Clinton as director of the Bureau of the Census. Sometimes think of it as the last valid, good, statistically sound social census of the United States of America, but we won't go there right now. Um, and so it is with great happiness and joy that I present you with the Sage Casbus Prize. And we're supposed to stand on either side of you. <laughs> and I hate, I hate to say this, but <laughs> you're welcome. He's already spent the money. <laughs> Okay, photo up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I should say, spent it intelligently. <laughs> that goes without saying. Uh, it, it's an honor, um, but it's a very special honor to be presented this honor by Sarah. So thank you. Um, if I went into why I don't deserve it, I would end up talking about myself, and you really don't care that much about me, so I want to turn right immediately to my, my uh, presentation. Um, one way to summarize what I've heard already this morning, um, uh, starting with uh, the uh, keynote, uh, and then the four panelist panels, uh, and I know this will continue this afternoon, um, is we may be, or we are, on the edge of the beginning birth pangs of what is going to be a new social science for this country. Uh, at least the new data pangs are that too much. Oh. Maybe I'll skip the opening sentence. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I just want to very quickly summarize that uh, um, the, the social science that I grew up in with Sarah and many people in this room, um, uh, that really gets its start in the 1930s with the invention of sampling theory, the discovery of sampling theory, um, has really worked out a whole lot of very important big issues. 
It worked out the issue of privacy. The Census Bureau are secure. For the census data are secure, as all the federal statistical system is secure. Um, it worked out the issue of quality. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of papers and professional meetings and books and so forth struggling with how to make sure that data meet certain kind of quality standards. And we know very well where it doesn't, where the error terms are, and so forth. It uh, worked out the, the uh, a problem of uh, rec replicability. We used the same question over and over and over to make sure that we measure the thing in the same way. Um, and we were very transparent about the methods themselves. That is, we don't think science is the finding, we think science is also the process of producing the science. And so we're transparent, et cetera, et cetera. I could go on, um, but I just want to say that none of those big problems that we have spent 75 years solving are yet solved for these new data. Not the issue of privacy, not the issue of replicability, uh, not the issue of trend lines, uh, over time measurement. Um, uh, uh, not the issue of quality at all, as Joshua Cohen said in his, one of the sessions this morning, the, the Apple data are a mess. But they don't care if it's a mess because it serves their purpose and that's fine. They can have a messy data set and, and, and still use it for their purposes. But if we now migrate those data, some of those data, into the domain of social science, uh, we're going to have a huge new set of questions about data quality and so forth. That's just my, that's where I think we are. That's not what I'm going to talk about in this lecture. What I really want to talk about this lecture is what's the landscape on which this, uh, this kind of new, and I'm also talking neuro, neuroimaging and, and uh, genetic stuff and all the whole array of new things that are coming along, not just, not just digital data. Um, but I want to talk about what the landscape is for that. And I'll do this as follows. Um, Earlier this year, a member of the Stanford administration, senior member of the Stanford administration, at a symposium roughly like this, boasted that Stanford had never been an ivory tower. It's an interesting boast because uh, certainly when I was getting my own PhD at this particular university, we did boast we were an ivory tower <laughs> in the sense that we were, um, it was an isolated special place, secure from pressure from commercial uh, demands, uh, uh, pressure from the church, if you will, from religious dogma, and secure and protected from certainly uh, the, the state itself and political intrusion into our work. So we sort of took for granted that the term ivory tower stood for a certain kind of science, basic, uh, fundamental, um, and indeed the word pure was sometimes used. We talk about pure science. Um, it's odd then that you would have Stanford boasting today that it was never an ivory tower. So I want to unpack that a little bit because it's partially true and the part of that is true is that even as we were building that science um, uh, over the last decades and decades, um, we were also saying to ourselves and saying to our publics that we cared about making sure that this science made a difference. So we're now into the vocabulary of, um, of impact, of consequences, of, um, of practicality, of policy advice, of new kinds of products, uh, new kinds of practices. So there's a whole vocabulary um, about engagement uh, that kind of grew up with us but it was always secondary to the first vocabulary, which was the vocabulary of autonomy, of independence, of basic uh, analysis, and so forth and so on. Um, look at quickly at the web pages of mission statements of the three sponsoring institutions uh, of, of this symposium. Uh, CASBIS, as Margaret said this morning, better societies you're going to create, that's great. Um, uh, look at the mission statement. Confront the problems of the day. <clears throat> Offer ideas that will change the world. The word transform is in the statement of this very symposium. Uh, the Social Science Research Council. Uh, look at its webpage. Uh, and I quote, mobilize knowledge on important public issues. Link research to practice and policy. Sage publications, 50 year birthday. And I'm sure if you asked Sarah, she would say the same thing 50 years ago and say it again today. The purpose of SAGE publications, and I now read, 
to support the dissemination of usable knowledge. So here it is. We have a whole vocabulary of we're going to have make the world a better place, and yet we're also claiming uh, autonomy, uh, separation from, and independence from, and so forth and so on. That's the puzzle I want to uh, uh, talk about a little bit. I think we have to sort of figure out what's the balance right now between those two, not necessarily, but somewhat inconsistent uh, uh, goals and missions and so forth. What's the balance, and how is that balance shifting? and what kind of science policy or scientific landscape are we inhabiting as we sort of watch that shift uh, take, take place. Um, I will talk narrowly, narrowly about a science policy, but it's a big complicated thing, of course, but I really want to just simply address the issue of if we are asking for public funds to do our work, which is to say if we're going to go to the NSF and try to get money from them and so forth and so on, then that's the part I'm going to talk about. Then it raises the question of who decides on the purposes and outcomes that justify taxpayer investments in our research. Now, most of you in the audience will know that um, uh, the uh, founding document of our science policy, as we've known it over the last half century or longer, uh, was a, a publication by the federal government called uh, Science the Endless Frontier. It was a government report. Um, you've got a nice thing on the, on the sage, um, uh, SAGE table out there. This is kind of a chronology of some of the big things that happened to the social sciences over the last 50, 60 years. And it starts with Vanover Bush. It's the very first uh, item that appears in this thing. And that's, that's where it, it should start. Science the Endless Frontier was powerfully shaped by the nation's experience when World War II. Um, and I summarize this quickly, but the country took three lessons away from it. First, scientists were loyal. They dropped everything they were doing. They went and into the laboratories, into the agencies, and so forth and so on, and dedicated their efforts. Second, they produced, from radar to the atomic bomb, uh, from the design of supply chains to code breaking, the social sciences were there in, in mass as well. Um, and third, science had specialized procedures to self-police. They detected fraud, and they, detected, and they got rid of it, and they found the weak links, and they so forth and so on. They had an internal set of procedures that we would now call peer review, but they sort of managed the system quite intelligently. So tax dollars for science was an easy sell, as was deference to sciences. There was, of course, some accountability. They are public dollars. But this accountability regime was very lightly administered much, much more attention went into scientific autonomy. And if you look at the founding of the National Science Foundation, watch the debates, that was the crunch. How much autonomy would the scientific community get for these public dollars? And it was a lot. They negotiated it, they fought over it, congressional hearings and so forth and so on, but the re end result was there would be a National Science Board that would worry about the scientific agenda for the National Science Foundation and the allocation of monies to different parts of the, of the scientific community and so forth and so on. Indeed, the, found, the document that was written at the time, a very important book, by the way, on the founding of the National Science Foundation, was titled, A Patron for Pure Science. Therefore, the ivory tower was alive and well in, in the 1950s. Uh, uh, this is not where we are now. And um, uh, partly because um, academic scientists are more likely to be viewed as just another lobby group agitating for money to do their stuff. Uh, Self-policing is less robust than we thought it was. We have issues of replicability. We have issues of fraud. Uh, we have conflicts of interest, uh, not in great number, but they're enough to get public attention. Um, and there's a claim that the scientists can sometimes slide from their purity into advocacy. And you hear the debate about climate change, uh, intelligent uh, design, uh, regulation of food and drug, and so forth. It's sort of, they're not quite as pure as they say they are. They're a little more selfish than we thought they were, and they don't self-police as carefully as we thought they could. Therefore, the conversation between autonomy and accountability has sort of crept into science policy conversations. Now, that is unfolding as two things are happening. 
First, the infatuation with performance metrics. It's big. It's across all sectors. Uh, I, I just looked up how many, how many uh, rating systems and performance systems, metric systems, are there on the nature of, of the state or government itself. There's over 100. They come out of NGOs. They come out of international organizations and so forth. And they're all over the place. How fragile is the state? How friendly is it to business? How corrupt is it? How democratic is it? How accessible is it? Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and I could go on sector after sector after sector and say the same, the same thing is true. We are swimming in a sea of performance metrics. And don't think you're not going to continue to swim in that sea for some period of time. Um, so that's the first thing I want to uh, mention before I get into the substance of this. The second thing is that, um, well, before I leave that, I should say, about it, that is also being now focused on the scientific community itself. We didn't actually think that was going to happen. <laughs> we thought that was for other, how good is the government, how good are the schools, how good are all kinds of things. Um, we didn't actually think that uh, we were going to be uh, targets of that. Uh, our colleagues in the UK have just written a really very important book on this uh, titled The Metric Tide. And when they mean the metric tide, they mean metrics to assess and manage scientific research. Not something outside of us, but us ourselves. Um, powerful currents, they write, are whipping up the tide. Growing pressure for audit and evaluation of public spending on higher education and research. Um, demands by policymakers for more strategic intelligence on research quality and impact. And then for this conference, here's the kicker increases in the availability of real-time big data on research uptake and the capacity of tools for analyzing uptake. So we're now being subjected to the same kind of, of scrutiny and demand for metric and so forth as other sectors of society. It all sounds so reasonable. If research universities claim relevance and beneficial consequences as a justification for government funds, why should Congress not ask for evidence that that is so? Why should there not be, forgive this little quip, evidence-based accountability to make certain that the investment in evidence-based policy, which we're urging, is worth the investment? So we have now hit a moment, it seems to me, where um, uh, we are going to be uh, uh, subjected to this and I will talk in a minute about how I think we deal with that. The second major thing I want to say before we get there is we know more than it is being used. If we know this much about terrorism, maybe this much about what we know is being used for policy purposes or whatever. If we know this much about early childhood intervention, maybe this much is being used uh, for teacher practices and school policy making and so forth. We're constantly complaining that we know so much more than anybody uses. It's, I call it the big wine. Um, and so we're feeding the image out there in the society that our stuff is not as important as we say it is. We say it's extremely important science, therefore, why isn't it being uh, uh, used? So we have a gap between our claims about how much we know and our claims about how much it gets used despite our vocabulary about better societies and usable knowledge and so forth. And the other th thing I want to add to that sentence, we don't know because we haven't studied the magnitude of the gap between knowledge that we have and knowledge that's being used and the causes for the gap. We just don't know. I'm not saying knowledge isn't used, science, art and science hasn't been used. I can give you all kinds of anecdotes. Everybody in the room can give you anecdotes. But that's what they're going to give you, anecdotes. We do not have systematic understanding about why is it that we have to go around with a big wine uh, all of the time, that we're not being paid attention to and so forth and so on. That is now intersecting with the performance metric regime. 
and, and that is what's really beginning to complicate our lives. I won't go through book and chapter about what's happening in the Congress today as we speak, and last week and next week and so forth, with respect especially to the social sciences in the National Science Foundation. Some of you are up to date on that, not all of you are. You don't have to worry about it. You can just trust me. It's a very messy situation. Okay, here's what I'm now going to recommend, that we're going to have to create a, if, if our current science policy is frayed, we're going to have to sort of figure out what is a new kind of science policy for this country in the 21st century in the face of, of the new databases and all the stuff we talk about here, in the, in the face of performance metrics, and in the face of a very strong interest right now uh, for an accountability regime uh, to balance and maybe even overbalance, if you will, uh, the autonomy regime that we have enjoyed for uh, the last uh, half century. Um, I start with the um, word autonomy. We're familiar with the phrase basic versus applied. I reject that phrase. I would like to bury it, and I would like to replace it with a different phrase. Knowledge that is used and knowledge that is waiting to be used. Quantum mechanics in the 1920s was knowledge, big, deep, serious science. And they didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know that we were going to have all of our little gadgets. Uh, they didn't know there was a Moore's Law. Uh, so it was fundamental basic science that turned out to have a lot of practical consequences. There was some lag time, well, so be it, so some lag time. I can say the same thing about early childhood intervention. We knew a lot more about it scientifically, and it took a while before it got into uh, school reform, uh, pre-K education, and uh, parental practices, so that we shouldn't be surprised that there is a, a phasing of the use of science and I happen to think the phasing is much more important for the story we have to tell than the fact there's something basic and something applied. Uh, I just think that's not a very useful dichotomy. So I want to talk about knowledge that is used and knowledge that is waiting to be used. And I want to argue that we produce, are capable of producing knowledge so fundamental that it will be used. Higgs boson now is not being used. It will be used. It just will. It is too fundamental. It explains everything about everything. So guess what? Uh, there will be venture capitalists who suddenly figure something out, or there will be uh, the DARPAs who figure something out and so forth. It is not going to be unused. So let's keep that in mind as, as I try to make an argument for how to handle the autonomy um, uh, issue. Um, and I think this has got to be negotiated with our, 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 our politicians, our political leaderships. It's got to be negotiated more generally with the society. Um, and I want to start this negotiation by making uh, 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 two simple arguments. Um, it is seriously wrong-headed to deny science an autonomous sphere. We won't call it the ivory tower because that's turned into a nasty word. But we know that science needs space in which to fail. It needs to have the opportunity to serendipitously stumble around until it sort of discovers some unlikely but revealing uh, connection. It needs to pursue knowledge whose uses are not initially predictable, but then come as welcome surprises. Um, but I want to advance that argument not with metaphors of the ivory tower or science for the sake of science, I want to uh, advance that, that argument on the basis of, um, of I, I hesitate, but I'm going to use a, uh, I'm going to use a um, acronym, um, USBAR, U-S-B-A-R. You've not heard it. It's, I just wrote it down last night or the day before or whatever, so I don't know. Um, but USB is unintended social benefits. And AR is appreciated retroactively. <laughs> and it's really important, 
if, if we could sort of communicate that as part of uh, the new autonomy uh, regime, because it is not us wanting to, you know, write books for ourselves and go to fancy conferences and talk about them and so forth, and we're indifferent and so forth and so on. It's very consistent with all the conversation about impact and consequences and use and, and so forth. But it has to say that um, you've got to let us stumble around until we find some stuff basic enough and important enough that it will find uses. It will find uses in the commercial sector. It will find uses in the policy process. It will find uses in the, um, in, in the practice, uh, the social practices, and so forth and so on. Um, so um, uh, USBIR, you heard it here. Uh, <laughs> You, you can also forget it here. <laughs> you, you, you. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a different way to approach, it seems to me, the argument for autonomy. It's not original. It's the, the, the vocabulary is a little bit original, but it's not, not, uh, not uh, uh, original. What I want to say about it is that, by definition, it has no space for performance metrics. By definition, you can only measure its importance after the fact. Today, we can measure the consequences of, of quantum physics. And it would be a huge metric of how much benefit is brought to this society and other societies. Huge. But we could not have done that in the 1920s. We actually can now measure the benefits of early childhood intervention. But we could not when we were struggling to conceptualize it. Um, uh, we, uh, you know, Watson and Crick did the double helix structure of DNA in 1953. And today we're talking about personalized medicine. And so we will sooner or later be able to give a metric for the importance of personalized medicine. My argument is it's the same science at different phases. It's not two different spheres of science, one which is basic, one which is applied. It's the same science that starts out to be really good, important knowledge and then produces a lot of very beneficial outcomes. Um, now, um, if we can get away with saying about the autonomy into the game, we don't want the metrics. We cannot and even should not try to get away from performance metrics with respect to the accountability regime, the other half of the, of, of the equation. So I want to um, now talk just in, in the rest of my uh, minutes about the accountability uh, regime. Um, uh, let me make a couple of initial preparatory, or preparatory comments. Uh, one, for more than two centuries, science, including the social science, have pushed their way into society, generating research findings relevant to just about everything. How to stay healthy at 90, how to find a terrorist, how to explore outer space, defend the homeland, build a just society, raise a child, shorten travel time, et cetera, et cetera. Huge list of things which we're pushing all the time into the commercial sector, into the policy sector, into the practice sector. Don't be surprised that there is some pushback as those sectors now want to push their preferences and their interests into the scientific community. If we're, if we're saying that we're relevant to everything, it seems like they're going to say, and they are also us as citizens and taxpayers and so forth, um, are going to say, well, but here's how I see it, or this is what we would like, and so forth and so on. So we're in this kind of very funny moment where, on the one hand, enormous respect for the, for the productivity and capacity of science to produce social benefit, and yet a, a, a complicated conversation about how we're going to be held accountable for how well we do that. Um, the second general thing I would say, and this is where it gets difficult, but I think we have to make the case, um, only scientists can judge what constitutes good science. We can pick the best people, we can pick the best designs, we can rate them, we can know how things fit together to produce bigger theories and so forth. If you're outside of the scientific community and you try to do that, you will mess it up. You will not do a good job because we have to be in a position to judge the quality of our own, our own work. On the other hand, only those in the spheres of government, co commercial sector, civil society, have the experience and expertise to judge how and when the evidence can be used to build a better commercial project, to create a different policy, uh, to create a social practice. 
That is, it's the people who are actually using it who are going to make the decision about its use. If the city council wants to build a bridge and they come to the scientific community, the engineers, and say, okay, what do you think? We can tell them, you know, if you build the bridge there, this will happen to traffic flows. If you build it there, that will happen to traffic flows. And we can tell you how to build it so it won't fall down. But we actually don't tell them that they should build it. That's a decision they make as they balance this particular investment versus other investments and so forth. And so on. I could go on endlessly with this point. But we have got to be able to say, we know how to do science, but we actually don't know how to do policy and practice and product. Um, we know how to advise that process and talk to that process, but we ourselves in the scientific regime do not, it's not our job. Uh, and that is the job of people who get elected or who have businesses, who are parenting or, or, or what have you. Now, if you, if you can buy into those premises, this is the accountability regime using performance metrics that I would like to try to uh, uh, figure out how to establish it. Three criteria. Criteria one, research methods internal to science are designed to avoid self-deception. That's what methodology is. How do we keep from fooling ourselves about our own work? Uh, to correct for bias, for fraud, uh, for weaknesses, flaws, and so forth and so on. The same attention has to go into how we create the metric by which we're going to measure whether we're making a contribution to society. That's not going to be easy. But we have to be as ruthless about protecting from our own biases and our own preferences as we create that, as we do about trying to do the science in the first place. We have to self-police. Um, uh, we're already on the edges of claiming we know more than what sometimes we do. But if we now translate that into, and we have more consequences and benefits to give to you lucky people, and we exaggerate that claim, then we are not going to be able to put together performance metrics. Uh, so criteria one is be as careful about avoiding the, 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 our own self-deception about how important we are and how useful we are and how consequential we are as we are in doing our own, our own science. Um, second criteria, um, we have to be really clear and explain and convince and persuade that there are some things which we can attach a metric to and some things which we make a rough guess at, give or take this error term, and some things we simply can't get there, even though they're worthwhile getting. Um, what is poorly understood, or what do we know, what is poorly understood but maybe within reach, and what is beyond our current capacity. School dropout, we can actually measure that fairly well. We, we can figure out what the right denominator is. I know it's gamed all the time, but in the scientific community, we can figure out a way to measure school dropout. We can get better at, we're not there yet, but we can get better at value added. And that's a complicated thing, but if we get a really good metric on value added, that will contribute enormously uh, to the conversation. But consider this assertion. We invest in education in order to produce good citizens for the nation's future. That's an aspiration. That's not a finding. So you try to put a metric to that, you're just simply exaggerating the capacity of us to know a certain kind of thing. So the second, the second point is that we've got to really be thought to be playing fair in doing this, not to be gaming the metric system itself so that, um, so that we are, are measuring more contribution than we're actually making to the society. And so item one, we got to avoid self-deception and exaggeration. Item two is we've got to be really upfront about what we are capable of doing. Um, and then item three, um, and it's a very condensed statement here, uh, we've got to recognize that the metrics needed will differ widely across different disciplines, natural sciences, biological engineering, social sciences, behavioral sciences, humanities, and so forth. Um, and it's compounded because we're talking to three different sectors. We're talking to the policy sector, we're talking to the commercial product sector, and we're talking to the practice sector in the civil society. Um, I think we can do it. I think we're smart enough to sort of negotiate a, a measurement system about the use, not just how good is our science, but about its uptake, or its consequences, or its impact. And that if we actually do that, 
in a, in a negotiation with the stakeholders, the rest of the society, that we will have done some very, very important uh, for our science in the next uh, half century. So, um, um, let, let me summarize or, or conclude it this way. Um, basically, for the last half century since Vannevar Bush and so forth, implicitly, the autonomy accountability conversation has been zero sum. You know, if you have a lot of this, you're going to have less of that. And if now the country is expecting more on the accountability, we're going to lose autonomy. And I think the contract we're going to have to negotiate, we're not going to just own it, we have to negotiate it with Congress and a lot of, it's got to turn that into a positive sum game where, the, where both sides are going to benefit if we are willing to say, leave us alone to do the best science we can but when we're talking about the contribution that science is going to be making to society, then you have a right to know how well we're doing it. And that's a, and that creates, I think, a positive sum, uh, sum game. I want to then finish by saying, we know more than is being used, but we don't actually know much about why that is so. We have to study that because we're not going to be successful talking to the government and talking to the uh, commercial sector and so forth, unless we are cleaner and sharper about the whole issue of, of, of not even studying the fact that we could study how well we do at what we do. Thank you. Um,